We knew as soon as we hooked up that it was doing some short runs, some short head bobs, but it wasn't really running side to side. In the video, we really didn't drift too far from where we hooked up. No. The, that reel, that's the first big shark we've caught since we bought that reel, actually, and it did a wonderful job. All right, guys. Three bucks. One, One day, day. Same tree. Same tree. Oh, my God. I'm so Woo! Holy shit. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Get a shot of these. <laughs> Two farms this year. Number one is done. Did you say bye, Kevin? I did. I already did. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Kevin. Bye, Kevin. Look at that. You destroyed it. Joey, the shop yeah. is closing up. Make sure he takes all his right antlers. You can't leave. All right. Welcome to the Deer Shop Podcast, Episode 2, presented by Simon Brothers Outdoors and the Leaky Jumbo Company. And we are in Episode 2, and we have not talked about deer hunting yet. No, and we're not going to talk about deer hunting this one either. We're actually going to talk about surf fishing. And the beach. Because we just got back from the Outer Banks last night. Yesterday. Got back last night. And Late. it was a great time. It was pretty much a perfect time, I should say. Yeah, it was the perfect friends vacation slash fishing trip slash couples vacation slash everything. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. The only thing missing was mom and dad. Uh, mom went to Texas and dad was doing dad stuff. But we had a big, for anyone who doesn't know, we had a big friends um, Outer Banks beach house vacation that we mix with our annual shark fishing trip that we try to do every year, sometimes every other year, um, land-based shark fishing from the surf. And then we also try to add in the element of Luke's boat and sound fishing for trout and red drum. And we can touch on that real quick because it just simply... It didn't work out. It didn't work. The wind was too strong from the south and from the west, so we took the boat out twice and... We caught some flounder and some speckled trout. Mm -hmm. So we did catch one of the target species, which was good. We yeah, and we caught flounder, which was cool. I've never caught a flounder before, so that was something a little bit different. But we didn't really get the boat out that much because it just wasn't safe enough where we were. We were by the Oregon Inlet, and yeah. if anyone's ever been to the Outer Banks, you know where that is, and it's a huge inlet to the ocean. And there's big ships going through there, and we just couldn't keep the boat under control with the trolling motor. And then it turned out we were in some shallow water, and we got stuck a couple times, so we just came back the two times we went, and it just wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be, but we couldn't really fish it, so we spent most of our time on the surf instead, and that was awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird. The, f the first, or I should say last time we went down two years ago, the sound yep. killed the surf. They were wading out. They had a kayak. They went and fished the sound a bunch, and they were killing the fish, and we were having a real hard time on the surf last time. Um, there's videos for all this stuff that I can splice through, but we just struggled from the surf last time. Mm -hmm. And this time we really struggled from the sound, and we killed it from the surf. Yep. Yep. I don't think it could have been any better surf fish. If Luke wants to talk about his boat a little bit, it's set up as a pretty much like a Lake Erie, like a lake jumper boat. It does tread some water, so it doesn't work so well in shallow water. So that's why these people are using the flats boats out on the sound, because we were in half a foot of water at some point and pretty much beaching ourselves. Luke did have a flat bottom boat actually that he got rid of. The Leaky John Boat Company started with a big 18 foot flat bottom John Boat with a 20 horse on it and that would have been a lot more ideal but the wind still would have pushed us around yeah. and we just couldn't risk so, it. So talk about what your boat is now. What What is the So the boat now is a Starcraft Mariner 160 so it's 16 foot long. It's got a deep V got a 50 horse Evan Root on it and it drafts probably 18 to 20 inches of water and then when we went out we had four guys on there and a cooler and all the fishing gear so we were probably drafting up to 24 inches and that was just too deep in the water for where we wanted to fish and then the wind just pushed us I, mean, I think we had the trolling motor full power going against the wind and we were going backwards actually so yeah so that was a little scary especially when we have a I don't know a 40 year old mo motor is the motor is a 1988 or 1989 so yeah, so if that motor would have went out four. or if we hit a sandbar with that motor and screwed up the prop, we would have been calling somebody to tow us in. Luckily, we were right next to the U.S. towboat, which I have, and they would have just came out and been safe in five minutes. But we didn't really want to experience that, so we just came back in anyway. So. Yeah, but it w we'll show some footage. It was fun getting the boat out. We did catch some fish. It was fun getting out on the sound with it. Yeah, it uh 
I, I feel bad that Luke wasn't able to make what he wanted out of the week. So it was a two-part fishing trip. You know, we were going to do the sound side, the surf side. Luke had a lot of big plans for the sound side, and we all were actually going to help him with that. And he took the boat out early in the week, got it kind of set up, and it wasn't the best of times. And then when he went out the second time, it just it struggled. And then we ended up, you know, when you're on a friend's vacation, couple's vacation, there were some late bar nights and stuff. And so people weren't really getting up early. He did try to go wade a third time, right? I did wade at the uh, Pea Island kayak launch. It's a very popular spot, and I didn't catch anything there either. But Yeah, just unfortunately Luke's side of the endeavor didn't go as planned. But we can definitely talk about the surf fishing side, which is the reason why people are going to be watching this particular podcast, and it was about perfect. There's two things I would change about it personally, but otherwise no complaints about how the week went surf fishing wise um yeah so to give a little bit of a rundown uh we're obviously deer hunters from ohio so we don't spend much time on the beach much time fishing one week a year water yeah about one week a year we haven't been down there for two years yeah so we were uh trying our hand at land-based shark fishing that was our main goal and we were also trying to catch some uh, smaller fish in the surf but uh, land-based shark fishing was our main goal of the trip and we did accomplish that. And we did accomplish what we wanted to. We did catch the biggest shark we've ever caught. Yes. So that's, you know, that's exactly Something. what we go down there for. Yeah, that was yeah. some <laughs> sports sharks would have been cool. That yeah, four, that's, five foot first night, we yeah. think black tip would have been a nice one to land. So that's my, my notes. My notes say to go right into the first night when we got there. It was, you know, everyone kind of got down there at different times. It's a 12 hour drive for us. So people left at 3 a.m., people left at 4 a.m., some people left a little bit later. Um, we had four different vehicles, right? Mm-hmm. So we had 14 people, four vehicles, a uh, bunch of couples, and then some friends. And we got down there first night. Yeah, first nights are tough because you're kind of all getting into the house and trying to get acclimated. But we decided, you know, we're, go- we're going out. We're going to fish. We got the kayak there. We always rent a kayak, by the way. You got to throw us out there. We rent a kayak when we do this to get our baits out far. It's, it's required. Yeah, so the, the premise of our land-based shark fishing is a large reel, which I have this reel in front of me. It's a pen squall, 50 wide. So it holds about a thousand yards of a hundred pound line. So this this reel, I know some of the big time snobs when it comes to land-based shark fishing will say this is a smaller reel and they use much larger, but this is about as large as we are willing to go and as large yeah. as we're willing to pay for also because these reels are expensive. Yeah, and we know that they're the land-based shark fishing snobs may end up watching our podcast video or listen to the podcast or watch the movie i guess i forgot to mention that at the beginning we're making a full-length movie of the whole week um and the way we do our movie styles is a little bit of everything it's not going to be just fishing it's going to be the drive down the the time spent amongst friends the food we cook obviously the fishing um just hanging out i mean it's going to end up it'll be an hour long probably take a couple weeks to get out but hopefully we can pair this podcast with the movie and yeah so so uh to set the picture we're a amateur land-based fishermen uh, we have our own equipment own gear we all do it yourself pretty much everything we've learned from watching youtube videos that's what we do so the first night we got down there we decided uh we didn't exactly have the best rigs we had what we had left over from our last trip so we set out some rigs with the large pole and then we had some casting rigs as well and our first hookup was on a kind of a homemade casting rig and that's kind of how it happened yeah. the beef stick right mm-hmm. i love that rod yeah, so it's like a, I think it's a 12-foot, pretty heavy surf rod with a pen. I got it here behind me. Uh, it's just a spinning, it's a pen fierce. It's a 6,500 reel with 65-pound braid on it. So these are our caster rigs. So we cast it out a chunk of tuna belly, and we hooked up to what we believe was about a 5-foot black tip shark. I would say six foot, but Isaac says five. Yeah, well, you can be the judge in the yeah, video. Yeah, 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 we'll splice in some videos. Yeah, I'll splice the videos in. It'll obviously when you watch the full length movie, you'll be able to kind of see. We didn't get any great video of it. I got his dorsal, dorsal fin, and his tail, tail fin. fin out of the water because he was. We got him right to the shore. Ryan touched him. Yeah. So basically, when it comes to saltwater fishing, uh, we count this one as a catch because we touched the leader, we touched the shark. It just unfortunately broke the leader prior to us pulling it in shore to unhook it. I mean, it was a pretty for the shark. It was good. Because it didn't get drug up on land whatsoever. And that yeah, was a big it, part of what we're trying to do is properly land-based shark fish. I know the snobs, we'll call them, will find ways that we messed it up. But we yeah, didn't but it, have to drag them up. Yeah. Anyways, we, were make, we made some homemade casting rigs, and that's where we had the failure. So 
We have a, it's a haywire twist, so there's about a foot of wire connected to a large circle hook. I think this one was about a 14 to 16 knot circle hook. And then we just had a 130 pound mono leader on there when we normally should have had the uh, real thick weed whacker string. And that keeps the sharks from breaking it off with their tails and fins. And this shark came in close. It hit the leader with his tail and broke off because we were using that real thin mono. Yeah. But we were able to get a shark in on the first night. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was a good, yeah, good start for sure. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. we couldn't get it all the way in and get cool pictures and stuff. But it was still, and it was a pretty good fight on the yeah. lighter gear we were using as well. Yeah, it smoked, Ethan, he said. Yeah. It was a 12-minute fight. Yeah. Fighting 12, for 12, 12 minutes, running minutes. down the beach. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an over 100-pound fish. And for us that are used to catching uh, five-pound catfish and three-pound bass, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. And we had audiences on their balconies watching us and clapping for us and, and it's it, pretty, was, it was perfect it's pretty cool to hook up with one in the daylight as well for filming purposes yeah and that's that's always the you know we can make the night video work we have lights and stuff but to be able to hook up into them in the daytime is perfect is perfect but first night good shark right up on the beach not quite yet we, we're pretty sure it's a black tip right we're gonna say black tip we're, we're gonna chance. say it was a black tip maybe it, like a maybe a large spinner shark it did jump out of the water as soon as we hooked up we hooked up to it it was a casting rod, so it was probably maybe 50 yards off the surf. Yeah, These bigger rigs are kind of hard to cast, so yeah. probably not even 50 yards off the surf. I high, didn't see the jump. High tide was going down, so it was close. Yeah, he was yeah. real close. I didn't see the jump, but everyone's like, oh, my God. You know, We knew it was a shark right away, and we were pretty confident we were going to be able to get him in. I mean, Ryan's the one that had it was had the tail rope and lost it, but I don't think it was Ryan's fault. No. Yeah, I had a, a wave of, came in, and we told him to back up because you don't want to get smacked with a shark in a wave. You the five-foot shark. That, yeah. yeah. I, had, I had a hold of the leader, and when the wave came in, I'm sure he either wrapped his tail or his fin hit it. Something caused the leader to break, which we have it all on video, and Kit will splice some of yep. it in. And then, uh, so that was it for that night. Uh, we went out the next night. We were, we were pretty chubbed up on shark fishing at that point, so yep. we went out the next night in the afternoon. Um, and we didn't have any luck in the daylight, but as soon as it got dark on the second day, our casting rods, we caught two sharks, caught two spinners. I think we, I'm pretty confident saying they were both spinner sharks. Isaac's was a pretty good one. Um, yeah, these sharks were probably four, maybe four and a half foot long with the tails and you know fins and all that. Yours was a little bit bigger mm -hmm. than Ryan's. Yours was probably... I, I mean, if you if you actually lay it out and measure it, I'm sure he was actually close to five feet, but it's a three and a half foot, four foot body size shark with a yeah, big tail. Yeah, probably like 50 or 60 pounds. Able to pick it up, but not very well. Yeah, and it was a good, that was a great, uh, that, that even though it was at night, we got some great video. You brought him in. We had to take some cool pictures real quick, get him back into the water. Um, and this was the same rig, same, we actually made some rigs. We went to the store and got the proper stuff, and we made some yep. rigs with the proper uh materials so we didn't really worry about these ones breaking us off because we had that i don't know six foot it's it it looks almost like weed whacker string it's yeah. 400 pound mono and they can't break that off with their tails so it pretty was, much both of those were on a rug them in caster rig spinning rod both the beef stick i think yeah so yeah, i think they were both on the beef stick again so the beef stick had three sharks that week yeah and the beef stick is just a cheapo i can't even remember who it's made by cheapo surf fishing rod I love it. Probably like fifty dollars. And then these pen fierces, these reels are under a hundred dollars. So we're really using budget stuff compared to a lot of the the Stellas and all that stuff you see out there. People are using thousand dollar reels. So we're using pretty lightweight, pretty cheap gear and we're still having pretty good success with it. I wouldn't say theoretically cheap. We're using cheaper gear than the pros, but we're definitely a step above yeah, you know, your average Joe. I mean, this is some. This, there are there is some money involved in getting this stuff. Started. Yeah, and there's a lot of research that goes into it. We watch yeah. a lot of videos, and you know, we get in, inspiration from the bigger video channels out there. Our Once first time ever going down, we bought like the forty five dollar Walmart eight foot reels and rods. Yes, like these, ten years ago. And we we had some broken rods in the past because yeah. literally these rods are fifteen dollars. So we we have upgraded our equipment a little bit, but we're still doing it big time on a budget due to the fact that we only fish for like a week week out of the year yep but yeah those two sharks so the second one isaac actually missed the second spinner shark which was around midnight i think yep. yeah you guys were out there late we were out there late um it was a little bit smaller and isaac's probably only like a 25 30 pounder not quite as long it got wrapped up in a bunch of lines so we had to quickly try to unwrap and we got him in the water pretty good um that shark was the only one during the week that i was worried about not making a good 
release on. The sharks are very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not that they're not tough, but if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing and you screw around, you can kill these sharks. Yes, yeah, so you have to be very careful with them, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the bigger shark that we caught. Yeah, but we got them in the water pretty quickly. Like we weren't just yeah, laying them there on the but beach. But we just had to. We really had to mess with it. Low manpower. Yeah, yeah, we were down to a skeleton crew per se. So we, go, you know, normally we have six, seven guys that can help bring in other rods, and that's another thing we're talking about. When you catch one of these fish, you gotta have guys bringing in other rods. We gotta have guys filming. Uh, luckily, Lindsay was there. Lindsay and Annie were able to run some cameras um, if the guys were all too busy. And and these fish immediately run down the beach when you hook yeah. them. It's very rare that you're pulling a shark in right where you hooked it. I think with that spinner shark, we ran a couple hundred yards down the beach, and yes. that was a small one. So, and then when he, the one that broke Ethan off on the first day that we got to the surf, he, we were at least 100, 200 yards down the beach, yeah. maybe even farther. Yeah. So these fish run with the current, and they just like to run sideways. So when there, when there's a hookup, yeah, you get the other rods that are in the way out, and then you got to have someone running the camera. We try to get two camera angles. We always want a good main camera, and then a GoPro to catch it just on accident. You know, the GoPro will catch everything that the main camera misses because because of the orientation. And then when the shark gets close to shore, you gotta have two or three people try to rope him in, drag him in. You gotta have someone unhook it while the main rod's being held. So the guy that's actually reeling the fish in can't do any of the filming, can't do any of the unhooking. So he's kind of out of play. So you need, I know there are professionals that just go out there and do it themselves and they're fine, but we're not at that point yet. Yeah, and it is it is a bit of pandemonium when one of these rods goes off because to, to set the stage a little bit, we have these rods out while we're pretty much having our family beach day. Mm -hmm. So we go down to the beach, you know, set up tents, set up beers, you know, yeah. setting up music, and we're down there with the whole family. Boogie boarding. Yeah, we're down there with the whole family having a beach day while these reels and rods are in the water. And then when one of them goes off, you kind of have to scramble on figuring out who's going to get the rod, who's going to get the camera. And it's pretty much pandemonium until that fish is back in the water. You missed the big one. You missed, right? I at was first. getting dinner ready. So, yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to the next one. But there, there's times when there's guys, you know, we were doing fireman-style dinners, so each family or group of people, would, you know, took a night where they cook. So Ethan was at the house when we hooked up on the good one. but Just took a shower. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it is, it's a lot of effort to catch these fish. If you think you're going to go out there by yourself, and I mean, just to kayak them out, we could start with that part. Just yeah. to kayak the baits out, you need, you know, three, three people, people to launch the kayak. I know, once again... The LBSF yeah. snobs will be like, ah. People no. do do this themselves, but we like to be safe about it as well. Yeah, and we can't use, I think we could have used a slingshot legally, but there's no drones, no cannons where we're at. So where we were fishing, you can't use the unmanned methods to take your bait out. Yes. You can cast and you can yak. In, in the state of North Carolina, <clears throat> you cannot use a drone to set your bait or to help you fishing in any way. So right. I know a lot of people, they'll see the videos on YouTube and they'll be like, oh man, why don't you just use a drone to drop your bait? Which we actually have some drones that could do that, but legally in the state of North Carolina, you are not allowed to do that. And a lot of the people, just to premise too, a lot of the videos you're going to watch with these guys catching these awesome sharks are in Florida. So they're in Florida, maybe southern Georgia. Like North Carolina, obviously where we fish, you can, there are sharks that can be caught and some big ones, but you know, it's like, it's not the to huge. relate it to deer hunting. It's not Iowa. Yeah, it's We're not fishing the, is not the Iowa of deer hunting. Not the no. huge mecca of land-based yeah. shark fishing. That's Texas it's, and Florida. Yeah, and it's the wrong time of the year. Yeah, and we are here midsummer. Like I said, this is a family vacation that we decided to do some fishing on. So we pretty much just uh, wanted to do the best with what we could could do. Yep. Uh, Luke, does you want to talk about the small fish we were catching a little bit? So when we were shark fishing, I was kind of in charge of doing all the bait fishing setups and we'd catch them for bait and we'd catch them just we even let them go after we got enough in the cooler for yeah just trying to have fun trying yeah to it's pretty much fun fishing. the girls wanted to reel some in and everyone just you know m most people just wanted a real fishing so we were just throwing out uh pompano rigs with like a four ounce pyramid weight that's the weight that we found worked the best it held held the best in the surf but it was still light enough we could cast it on our 30 and 20 pound braid rods they're just six to seven foot rods on I think one's a Penn Fierce 2 6000, and the other one was just a Penn Battle 2. And neither of them have the live line rigging or whatever you want to call it, like the uh, the drag set. You just cast them out and pretty much wait for the rod to move a little bit. And you'd have a croaker or a go. I think I, Ethan caught some spot, I believe. Yeah, we'll spotted croaker. The guy was called Spot Croaker. Yeah, so Spot caught, Croaker. Were well, okay. you catching whiting? Whiting. I caught mostly were whiting, but we did catch two little tiny sharks. <coughs> and we got some video of those. I don't know what 
what kind of fish what species forgotten. they were, but they were like, I mean, they were eight to ten inches long. They were tiny. You didn't even know babies. We were fish. calling them dogfish, but that's yeah. probably not true. But yeah, and we it them. is so hard to ID these sharks, especially when they're small, because a lot of times these small sharks, they'd be like a dogfish or just a small species of shark. And a lot of times people think they're like, oh, it's a baby bull shark or something like that. But it's really hard to tell, especially for us to amateurs. So these were just small sharks. That's pretty much what we were calling them. Yep. I'll be able to show that. Ryan caught one. You caught. You caught one. one. And you Ryan caught one. one. Uh, then we took a night off. Uh, we went out and did some restaurant stuff. Uh, never ended up making it back out to the beach on Tuesday, I believe. And then Wednesday was the big shark night. So big shark day. Big shark day. Okay. So we let's set the stage for Wednesday. Wednesday, you know, we didn't go out Tuesday, do much fishing, so we were pretty chubbed up to uh, get out there. We decided to make it a point we were going to tone back the partying on the beach and the drinking to be able to make sure we made a production of what was happening. So we took a lot of B-roll. Uh, we did a good intro. We uh, introduced what we were doing. We had a big tune ahead that we had bought. Dylan bought it, I think. Dylan or Freeman. Dylan bought that somewhere. one, yeah. Bought a big tune ahead. Um, the video will show how Isaac zip tied the hell out of it to get it all. Yeah, secured. we wanted to make sure this tune ahead would not come off. Uh, we had a big shark rig. It was actually a black tip H, monster yeah. shark rig is yep. what they call it. So it's a it's a big hook. Caleb has one right here. You can hold up in front of the camera. Yeah, I was opening my beer with it. Just now, but. Yeah, so I think it's a twenty knot hook. I mean, it's the size. I don't know. It's about the size of a beer can. The hook. Yeah. It then it has a haywire leader on it that's about two foot long and then it has like 20 foot of 450 pound mono which like i said is weed whacker string so we knew the rig wasn't going to be a problem yeah we're using it on the big big rod it's a stand-up rod it's like a six foot rod mm -hmm. but it's built for really it's built for pretty much fighting big tuna on a boat so that's what we're using from the beach and we kayaked up bait probably three to four hundred yards out uh, this, the ocean was a little bit rough and we wanted to go a little bit further, but it's so hard for us to tell where we're going. And yeah, I, I, I took that one out. It was, I get to, like, my vision's, uh, anyone knows my vision's not very good as it is. And once you're out that far on a kayak and you're looking back to shore, you know, we have our system of if guys are to the right, you got to move to the right. If guys are left, you got to move to the left. If they spread out, you got to drop it. And it, it's hard to judge the distance. You know, I was, we had a pier to kind of reference, and I was past the pier. And, but once you're out in 20 to 30 feet of ocean water, you know, on a kayak with a tuna head on the back of yeah, it. Yeah, you're out there. And then you got to reach back, un you know, unhook your tuna head. We got a good drop on that, though, and I made it back okay. You know, the cup sometimes bringing the kayak back is a little sketchy because you get whacked by a wave. I got a couple of videos of Ethan. Yeah, and plus the current and all that. Spilled out. But so it is a process to get the It is a process. And plus we're using a giant weight. And we think we're using a 10-ounce spider weight. So that hooks in the sand. So it's also a process to bring the baits back in. But to keep it from drifting out there, which we didn't really have too many problems with it drifting. That 10 ounce held pretty well. And this was probably 1 o'clock when we got that out there? I would say, yeah, it was er early afternoon where we got the bait finally set and the rod in the water. And I think that was the only rod we had out that day, if I remember right. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Maybe, maybe we had some smaller rods, too. Yeah, we might have had a couple small casters. But that was the only rod that we had out specifically for sharks that day. And then I'd say, what, about 3, 4 o'clock? Yeah, or, five. Or four or five o'clock was it at five? Oh yeah, you were getting yeah you were getting dinner ready. So Ethan went back up to get dinner. We were eating dinner at five thirty six o'clock. Our house was within walking distance of the beach. We were right we were beach front on our house, so that made things real that made things real nice. But yeah, then so we're all just sitting around all day, pretty much just you know bullshitting, drinking beer, hanging out on the beach. Yeah, pretty much having family beach day. And then we hear the sound. This is the sound we were waiting for all week. It's, kind of like, it's like the scene from Jaws when Quint is in the back seat and, he, and his reel starts clicking a little bit and he's yeah. getting ready. The ones that had never heard it before weren't, wa weren't aware, but the ones of us that knew what it was were like, I mean, we are jumping up. Here we go. It, like, jumping he up. He took a short run. He took a short, like, 10 yeah. clicker and stopped. We, and Isaac got kind of ready, and then he took another little run. And then that's when you, you don't set the hook, but that's when you tighten it up on him and. Yeah, people don't understand that you can't just jerk the rod and set the yeah. hook when you. We're not bass fishing here. When you have four or five hundred yards of heavy line out there, in order to have any input on the end of that line, you pretty much have to run back on the beach about ten feet. But these circle hooks you, are. You designed, ran back about a hundred feet to see you yeah. know, in the video. Yeah. Well, these circle hooks are designed. As soon as you put pressure on that line, they pull to the corner of the mouth and hook in. 
So you're not really hooking like a bass where you set the hook and you just get that hook stuck in the bass's mouth anywhere. This is designed specifically to go to the corner of the mouth as soon as you put pressure on it. Yeah, and then we were hooked up. And we pretty much knew right away what kind of shark this was due to the way it was fighting. We thought it could have possibly been a ray, but probably not due to the bait Yeah, the size. bait size. There's no, I mean, we're talking, this tuna head was this big. So, the, we're, you know, we, we were was, pretty confident. It was at least it, five pounds, the bait was. If it was a ray, it was a giant ray. Yeah. We actually didn't catch any rays this week. Nope. Which, which was, was like the first time in a long time. We saw some, though. We saw some in the surf. We did see some in the surf. And then we yeah, saw we a did. bunch in the sound. When we were in sound for the short amount of time, there's a lot of rays around, but yeah. But anyways, this shark, we pretty much knew the species it was, due to our uh, experiences in the past. Uh, the sand tiger shark, it's a pretty docile type shark. It's a bottom feeder, so it's eating rays and it's eating uh, dead fish off the bottom and stuff like that. And it's they're like pretty and pretty slow moving. So we knew as soon as we hooked up that it was doing some short runs, some short head bobs, but it wasn't really running side to side. In the video, we really didn't drift too far from where we hooked up. No. That, that reel, that's the first big shark we've caught since we bought that reel, actually, and it did a wonderful job. We swapped out people reeling a little bit just so they could Yeah, just so it. people could have a little reel, fun. Uh, my wife was on there for a little while reeling. She, she wanted, wanted redemption. Fish. All week she wanted to fish. Yeah, she had a couple trips ago, she had a real break off on her in a big stingray. So um, she wanted to reel. We got the people in who wanted to reel. It, for a, there was a period there where we thought maybe it got off. When he started, he started, yeah, he started coming started in. Started to coming the towards beat. us with the current, and we thought he might have got off. We were kind of concerned, and then there was a period where we thought it might have been a really small shark. For whatever reason, there was a period of time where it didn't feel like it was very big. But once he got into the break, he got pissed again, and that's when we knew. Yeah, and the more we read about the kind of shark, we pretty much knew that's how these sharks fight. And it was kind of a good shark to get everybody involved. Yeah, but we got it in fast. I don't know the exact time. But it I haven't watched the video, so I mean, I'm talking five six minutes. It had to be Maybe. less than five minutes. Yeah. We had this shark, and this real the real rod setup had no problem with this species and size of shark. And but we, it does get a little bit interesting once you get them into the surf. Yeah, because uh, uh, the sand tigers like to curl up. They'll like curl up like a like a catfish would basically. He'll, he'll smack his tail almost against his head. So, you know, you got to be mm -hmm. cognizant of that. And, and that, he was a lot bigger than we thought. Once we got him on the surf, we we're like. Holy shit. And the Texas and the Florida guys have a little bit of advantage when it comes to the surf because they have one, two, three-foot waves. We were dealing with five, six-footers trying to get this shark. Yeah. In. So that's where it gets interesting because we want to keep this shark in the water so we can safely unhook it so it doesn't get sand in its gills and we don't pull it up on the hot sand and blah, blah, blah. But we want to be safe to unhook it, get the hook out, and do it in the water but without getting hurt by the shark yeah when a five foot wave comes it's going to take this 200 pound log basically with teeth and just slam it into bodies and you got to yeah. be real careful with not that. not only can the body of the shark hurt you but these sand tigers have some pretty gnarly teeth that even if they just drag across your leg it's not like the shark's attacking you but right the front half of its body has those crazy teeth yeah. on it and that drags across your leg you are going to be in some trouble it's like a snapping turtle as long as you stay at the right angle he's not going to get you those sand tigers they can curl back pretty good but if you get within striking distance and he curls and bites, that's going to suck. I'll thing. show video of the mouth we took a couple years ago at night. Like They have a serious mouth on it with some serious teeth. And I feel like we were able to get this shark unhooked, cut off pretty quickly. Oh, I thought it was perfect. And uh, we did it without even taking it out of the water. We snapped a few pictures, and, and we pushed it back out. I swam out with it a little bit, but it, it swam off real strong, stronger yeah. than any shark we've had in the past. Because we didn't fight him for very long, and then we just got a quick unhook. We never got the perfect picture per se I, i'll show real quick on the screen a couple years ago when we fought our when we caught our first big sand tiger we all take a perfect picture the next one we caught was at night so it was hard to get a really good picture of the night shark and then you know this one we couldn't get a perfect picture because of the waves but we didn't want to take him out of the water fully and drag him up on the beach and do a whole yeah because we so. did catch some criticism last time for taking yeah. the shark maybe a little bit too far out of the water so this time we wanted to make sure it stayed in the water so yeah we did i mean it was perfect uh, it was it was perfect yeah, the, I feel group, like we did the group that hadn't seen major shark fishing got to see the biggest shark we've ever caught, released perfectly, fought perfectly. It was in the daylight. We went and ate dinner after that. I mean, it was it was a great. We had time. a crowd. Yeah, we had yeah. a crowd around us like always. I mean, it was just we had the 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 ocean rescue guys from the, the North Carolina like lifeguards firemen dudes come up and actually congratulate us. And sometimes those guys could be a little like you know uh, yeah, bring up sharks or, on shark ter or terrible. You know, if you have a terrible unhook, they get mad. But we got a quick fist bump in with them and yeah, went on their way, which was which was real cool. Yeah, everything everything was pretty much perfect with that moment in shark fishing. That's what we were hoping for for the week, and uh, yep. we we did it. 
like we said, we wanted to catch a hammer, a tiger, or a bull. We want or, or a nice black tip. We wanted to catch one of the sporting sharks. Yeah. But I mean, to be realistic, that would be a tall order for us where we're at. It's possible. It's definitely possible. We did we have did a it. nice yeah. We did have a nice black tip that we got in. So we did catch one of the sporting sharks. And if anybody watching or listening to this wants to see that and maybe comment on what they think about how we did and yeah. what the species was maybe in that first one because we thought it was a black tip but yeah. like we're not experts i did notice that the the shark you caught that first night his fins were kind of tore up from line big yeah. time but the shark with the big sand tiger that we caught on wednesday that's like big pristine. one he was pristine he had no cuts no scrapes no scars i mean that was i don't know how to tell the difference between female and male but it was a it was just a beautiful it shark was big. It i mean was it, big and it was a beautiful shark we could was, not have asked for anything better for our group that week pushing i would say at least seven foot long and probably pushing 200 250 pounds yeah i'm not very good at judging there's the no way there. for us to to tell the weight and uh we didn't want to really mess with measuring this thing we just wanted to get it unhooked and back in the water that thing had some heft to it though. but it was hefty there was no way we were picking that thing up no not a chance not safely and it was still very lively so there's oh, a yeah. video when we got it just up on you know in the break there's a video of that thing curling up and slapping the water i mean he was super lively at the shore so everyone's kind of standing back like, whoa, you know. Yeah, and it was pretty gnarly. Perfectly, but, I mean, that was the highlight of the trip. Uh, the next night, we went out partying, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we went out partying. We went, pre, we went pre-dinner we went to a, the bar we usually go to, Jack Brown's, kind of a small chain type bar, but it's a very nice local spot that we go to every year. And uh, put yeah, it we, we did some wall. golfing that day too. Yeah, I, yeah, some of the guys went golfing. Um, Nags Head, I think. Nags Head, yeah. yeah we, went to, we we did the all you can eat seafood tourist buffet thing. We went to Neptune's, I believe it was dive bar. Dive bar for some karaoke, and we had a lot of fun. Um, that's going to be in the in the movie. There's some good karaoke videos. Got slightly kind of more easily told to leave sort of deal <laughs> but um, it was one o'clock in the morning the locals four, didn't like us like one o'clock in the morning with 12 people there full of shenanigans that were it drinking. sounds so. like you guys were touristing hard yeah isaac wasn't there we yeah, were isaac was sleeping <laughs> no i was lights out drinking on the golf course all day all you can eat buffet i was out on the karaoke that night we we learned that the uh, the locals don't wear shoes even in bars which yeah was, which was kind of weird yeah, so we can talk about the OBX experience a little bit more so than the fishing. We are not new to the OBS ex- OBX experience. I've probably I was telling people this is like my seventeenth time down there. That might be a high guesstimation, but I mean it's it's probably, probably at least close. my thirteenth or fourteenth yeah. time. Yeah. There was years where I went twice. Yeah, actually. so we vacation down there every year yeah. or every other year since we were really little kids we took two breaks and we did virginia beach once because of ethan's navy and then they did myrtle beach a few times with like the younger Our friend group yep. younger group friend group went to myrtle beach a few times and i went on one of those but other than that it's almost always been and we just banks. we love the outer banks just for the scenery how remote it is how uncrowded it is i mean it's crowded but it's not crowded yeah compared to yeah a virginia beach or a the, myrtle the beach. giant beach, ha- beach houses we can get the small dive bar, all that part is cool about the Outer Banks. And we don't have a, a particular spot on the Outer Banks that we're, like, dedicated to. Um, we stayed at every of the major cities all the yeah. way down. Um, yeah, we've we have all no, the way We really from. don't have any preference. If you're doing a, if you're going to do a touristy type thing where you weren't too worried about fishing and you just wanted to have a good small town beach time, I would go to Duck, obviously. That's yep. where I would go. Yep. Way in the north side. We've done Kill Devil Hills a lot. We've done Corolla. We've done Avon. Uh, this was more of a Rodanthe type trip. So We, were we weren't really out in the city, so we were in the middle of kind of nowhere. But Yeah, we were pretty far south when it comes to the Outer Banks. We yeah. were down, down past the Oregon Inlet, but we weren't quite to Hatteras yet. Hatteras is the fishing mecca of the Outer Banks. We, we may try that sometime. We've never really fished down there before. Yeah, we've never made a good, we've never made a good effort to fish the point in that area, but but we weren't are, too too far from there. Yeah, these are family vacations where yeah. fishing is also happening, basically. Right. Because if we were going down there for a pure fishing trip, we wouldn't be going in July. Of July weekend. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, it was it worked out very well. I would go back to that exact same spot again. I haven't really said that about any of the places we've been down there, except for the one house and duck. The one year I definitely would go back to. But I would go back to that same exact house next time. Yeah, this place was, was really to cool. be able to catch a shark like that, like you know 170 feet from the back door of your beach house and catch multiple species of sharks four different species and private beach access yeah it was 
we were near a pier, which we kind of investigated a little bit, but we, we're not big on fishing off of piers. No. Well, I mean, we haven't really done it much. Actually, I don't think I've ever fished I don't think I have either. But when I, w- I did go down to the pier one night, we saw some people fishing. Somebody hooked up to a giant ray with a little tiny pole. It had no chance. And we're fighting it in the surf for a minute, but I don't know what they were doing. It finally broke off. But yeah, I mean, I would I would go back to that. There, I'm not going to give away the exact spot we were, but it's a spot that was very interesting to us because it's. A, I the, think maybe the, people can put it together. Yeah, and there was a that. there's a song about the spot we were at. Interestingly enough, but yeah, which was also cool because I yeah. like that song. Yeah, you do like that song, and it was not planned. Isaac, no, I had no idea that Isaac's that's... been listening to the song for a year. On our bear trip, we played it multiple times. Like, it's a song that him and Jay really like, and we were pulling into the spot, and there's a water tower, and it's the name of the song is on the water tower. Yeah, I don't, so I don't know if it's the town or village or just what they really call that intersection, but and I can't even pronounce it because it's really hard to pronounce. That's as much <laughs> hint as we'll get. But so yeah, Thursday night was a party night. We woke up. Luke tried to do some sound fishing on Friday morning. Yep. I was supposed to go with him. I didn't because I didn't wake up in time. But then he came back and was pretty down about it. So it's not that big of a deal. Because you guys were up till three o'clock. Yeah, in the stomping on. Yeah, we were. We <laughs> were. I'll show you some quick clips of that. We were. <laughs> not that any of the audience actually cares what was happening in our beach house at three in the morning, but we were making Isaac's life hell that night. <laughs> karaoke <laughs> and we were on the floor under the living room. So yeah. That was cool. Cartwheels on coolers. <laughs> Cartwheels on coolers. So then Friday, we decided it was our last day. We were going to beach it hard. I never left the beach. I think I was on the beach in my beach chair for 12 and a half hours. We put this big yeah. rod out at, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And Somewhere around there. Yep. All it was very sketchy. Day. And yeah. it sat it all day, not rough. doing a thing. It was there for 11 hours, and it did nothing. And it was dark, and we had a fire on the beach. We're just hanging out. It was a, it was a great last night on the beach, you know, having a little fire with a circle of friends. I mean, yeah, one of the very life doesn't get much One of the very few places where you can go to a big, giant beach house yeah. near cities and have a fire on the beach. Legally. Legally. I mean, it was literally heaven. In, in the U.S., I don't think you can do that in very many places at no. all. But So it was literally was- heaven. And then it was about 11 o'clock. Ten. Almost, it was, it was 10, 10, 10 o'clock, o'clock on the dot. Isaac was just about done with life, and yeah. it, it clicked. And we, hear, we just we hear heard it. it. It just starts doing and that. It started just clicking. Slowly, slowly clicking. So he held it. Nothing happened. We like, put oh, it back. We got jaws here. We put it back. It clicked again a couple times, went up to it, waited. And then it went for two. I, I, think, I, I think I have video of it. I think it went for two distinctive, like, 20-click runs. And yeah, then, where we thought for sure we had another shark. And, and we were we about were, to end it. We were about to end it perfectly. We were using a giant bait again. Yeah, we were back to the tuna head. It was a big, giant Massive. tuna head. At least six, seven pounds. This, this one was huge. So it, had, it had to be a big shark that was going to swallow this thing. And I think, unfortunately, that's what it wasn't. Yeah, I think it was. I believe. I'm with Isaac. I think it was exactly the opposite. I think another one of those. You know, maybe even less than 50 pound spinners was just mouthing it. It was grabbing a hold of it and running and pulling, with it. And with, if pulling that big weight across the sand, it's yeah. got to pull that with pretty pretty good force just to move that. So we think it was feeling that weight in the sand and then letting go and pulling it and letting go. And it probably did it like three or four times. Yeah, and then unfortunately, no hookup. No hookup. And we brought it in. The tuna head was still whole. It had it was eaten out a little there bit. There might have been some tooth marks on it. We some think tooth but nothing, marks, but nothing. I mean, it, it obviously wasn't current because it sat there for eleven hours and didn't click. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it actually went on some definitive runs. And, and, and we were when it was doing those definitive runs. We had the whole group down there. It was the last night, and we thought, oh man, here we. Do. And we actually had that happen one time. So our good shark fishing trip that we had a couple of years ago where we caught multiple sharks, bigger sharks, we had a, a last night hookup, and, it, and we brought it in, and it was a great thing. But we were unfortunately, that didn't happen this time. We were left with the one big, big shark, couple medium sharks, some small sharks. But I have no regrets with the way it turned out. No, it was an awesome vacation. It was a good, it was a good family vacation. It was also a good fishing vacation, too. Yep. It was both. You know, there was not a lot of drama in the house. You get 14 adults together drinking alcohol for seven days. Yeah, and, good luck trying to get everybody to. And we were off. good. I mean, it was, everyone left just as happy as they came, probably even happier. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, and, you know, being able to catch that shark that we caught. Yeah. It, well, and we are wearing some of the gear now, but we got to show off the leaky gear all week. Yep. And we had, we actually, you know, ironically, I wore my SBO shirt out the night that we were 
the blue and gold SBO shirt, which is everyone's favorite design and color scheme. I wore that the night we went out, and I got I had two different groups of guys come up to me and be like, "Hey, where can I buy one of those shirts?" You know, and then we end up talking to the guys. And the one was a fireman in Kentucky. The other one lived in Pennsylvania. was a bow hunter. And they're like, oh, man. So, I, you know, I was able to show them to the website. And they're like, those things are awesome. I want some. And, you know, that's when they, whenever we can get that accomplished, it's a good thing. Yeah. So good family vacation, good fishing vacation. We'll be able to get a cool video out of it for SBO. Luke will be able to get a cool video out of her leaky. Uh, we got a podcast, obviously, we're doing right now out of it. So it was good. Overall, it was good. Yeah. Major success. I mean, we're at 42 minutes. So we're going to be wrapping this thing up here real quick. Like I said earlier, I wasn't, I, I didn't want to say that this is going to be episode two, but I let it off right with it. So this yeah, is that was the be, first thing you said. I know. It's the episode two of the podcast. Um, coming down the pike, it is major, major, major deer preseason right now. So we yes. are velvet scouting, running trail cameras. We're just going to get into our fall food plots here. Some soon. nighttime scouting. Some nighttime scouting. Evening. Heavy, heavy minerals. Um, we got bucks showing up on all our farms. I mean, it's early shape up is pretty good, uh, better than last year. I'm, I'm happier with where we are right now than we were last year at this time, deer wise. I have got way less done than last year at this point, but the deer wise is good. Maybe we have struggled between those two things. Yeah, we have struggled with Southern Ohio getting down to the Gore Farm and getting that worked on, but I think I might be able to get down there this week and we can get some major stuff done. Um, yeah, we're not too behind the ball, actually. We're, no. Uh, we're no, rolling. No, life's good right now. We uh, Getting our bows ready? I'm still working yeah. on my basement for a secondary podcast location. I mean, we're going to do a lot of podcasts right here in the deer shop. That's what this place is named after. But we're going to have a secondary location done soon. Isaac needs to really get in the studio and finish up his mule deer video so we can get that out. Because he leaves in a little bit more than a month Yeah, we'll for the be, West. We'll be... Deer hunting, I'll be mule deer hunting and antelope hunting in a month and a half. So we'll be talking we are, about that in the future episodes. We yep. are really excited about that. And I will have that video done for probably me. next week, week and a half. That'll be a major, major release. As soon as we start seeing other people releasing their western yeah. mule deer stuff, we will start releasing ours. There's no set date on that. So by the time the this, OBX movie's done in the next By the time week this too. podcast release, the video will be coming out shortly after that. How many parts is it going to be? Two? Uh, probably a couple parts, at least. Because it's, it's a lot of footage. I was out there for almost three weeks. So lots of footage when it comes down to the Utah mule deer and Idaho elk. Locals, next week, Medina County Fair, we will be there all week. We have a booth in the community center, which is the big air conditioning building off of Pearl Road. We have a booth. We are also through the Medina County Hunters running, which is our other another thing that we run. We are going to be doing a whitetail mount display, so there'll be 50 Medina County whitetails there. Uh, some pretty good ones, just a random assortment of, of local Medina County hunters with their whitetails on display. And then Saturday of the fair is going to be the, like, basically, I don't know, we're going to call it the Legends of Medina County. We're going to have a bunch of 200-inch bucks there, including one of ours, Luke's Buck, will be there. Uh, we'll have a booth there all week where you can buy SBO and Leaky merchandise. Yeah, it'll be very cool. It's the first time. Yep. We've got out in the public as SBO, I would say. Yep. Our first booth ever. It's the first year for this show, and it's going to be kind of the launching pad for us doing future shows. So you and can I, buy some merchandise there. Not a lot. We're just going to have like a ba- basically a trial run of our merchandise, but you'll be able to get QR codes for the website, so you can go on there and see what else we have. And I think one of the days during the fair, if we can get a couple of us up there, we're going to do a podcast up in the booth. And maybe, depending on who's there, maybe we can get a couple guests in. Wednesday or Saturday early, I think. It'll be Wednesday or Saturday early. We might do it. We may actually do a quick podcast Saturday during the Legends display because we'll have a lot of people there that we want to talk to. A lot of people on it. We'll We'll definitely have some videos from that week as well. Yep. We'll be able to get people in and out. So that's for the local crowd. Um, For the national crowd, hopefully you're enjoying this podcast and uh, share it with your friends. I heard Clay Newcomb, I'm going to name drop, I heard Clay Newcomb say something the other day. We were listening to a bunch of podcasts all the way down. In order for the podcast to gain traction, you need to leave a review on the Apple and the yes, iTunes. Yes. Like any, anywhere where you're listening to the podcast, leave a review, you know, the, give us a star review and leave a comment, and that'll actually help the podcast. That's how they kind of gauge their and when it traffic. Comes, when it comes to YouTube, too, because these will be posted on YouTube in the video version. We have a couple of cameras rolling. Yep. Just like, subscribe. Yep, like, comment subscribe, on it. comment. 
Uh, I know the first two podcasts really haven't been deer hunting oriented. You know, we had our introduction. We had this OBX trip, but it will be heavy, heavy deer content from here on out for a while. So we might throw some other stuff in a little bit, but be prepared for some deer shot podcasting because it's going to get wild. We have some big things planned. Yep. And we have some big deer showing up. Yeah. But we'll talk about that at a later time. Life is good. Life's good. Life is good. Any final thoughts? No. Anyone the, got a drink or an empty yep. can? I got a empty land shark, yep. which we were drinking. Yeah, that's the reason we got the land shark in here is because that's what we were drinking all week. Land shark. That's the last flight. of them too. Yep. That's the last of them. We'll drink them again for another year or two. So uh, this is the Deer Shop Podcast. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. Hey, hurry up and take a picture, Caleb. Yeah, just get, Caleb. Him, get him de-hooked. I'm okay out here. I'm okay out here. Get him de-hooked. Get that hook somewhere. Can I touch it? Oh, sorry.